a very, very interesting show. We're going to talk to a program manager on the Visual Studio and .NET team. And um, this is probably a person that you know, you've seen her doing presentations, uh, videos, and, you know, all over the world as she travels to conferences. And um, we've never really gotten a glimpse into who is she as a person? What does she do as a program manager? And what does program managers actually do in sort of in general um, that works on Visual Studio? So without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Kendra Havens. And Kendra, can you please- Such an introduction. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I hope I live up to it. Hi, everyone. Hi, world. Can you introduce yourself, Kendra, please? Yeah. Um, so as Med said, I'm a program manager on .NET and Visual Studio. Uh, I've done a lot of work on productivity and um, less known is uh, my product work on the Test Explorer, which is actually my main focus. Um, so yeah, uh, traveling around, uh, doing lots of talks. You might have seen me on the internet or <laughs> on YouTube. Um, Scott Hanselman and I made a series of uh tutorials on getting started with C-sharp and .NET and uh, Visual Studio. I made one for um, .NET users getting started with Visual Studio to get installed and get ready. All right. So, Kendra, you are a program manager on not just the .NET team, which is your technical, like, or in the organization, you actually belong to the .NET team, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But your main job is working on Visual Studio. How does that yeah, work? Yeah, it's, it's a bit odd. I'm kind of um, in between two areas. So I work on .NET tooling uh, and all of productivity is, uh, I worked on that for a long time. I'm still kind of around um, Mika's, Mika Dumont, who may come on the show someday. She just did a Visual Studio Toolbox episode. So you, you all can mm-hmm. find her. Um, she's covering productivity and uh the productivity and .NET tooling, what I'm referring to is um, Roslyn, which is the C-sharp and Visual Basic compiler that uh, makes coding in C-sharp and Visual Basic really nice. Um, and so that would be like code fixes and refactorings that you find, light bulbs, um, the errors, uh, so the red squiggles and the green squiggles and the three dot um, grayed out suggestions that you see in your IDE is all sort of under productivity and in order to provide those, we need to have a lot of context on the language, and that's what um, our open box, open source compiler, Roslyn, does for us. So that's how we can provide all of those. And uh, so we interface a lot with the Visual Studio teams and like the editor platform team on um, how to bubble up, what, where, and what it should look like. Yeah. yeah. So there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of collaboration with the Visual Studio team, even though you're. You're on the .NET team, and, you, and the, the features that you and and I guess that Mika as well are building, uh, they ship with Visual Studio. So they're in the box, but they're created by a different team, not yeah. the Visual Studio team. So just to, I just want to make sure that the audience actually realize how uh, how, how that works because that's that's how all the Visual Studio is built. We have a, a Visual Studio team that's sort of a small core team. It's not really that small, to be honest. But it's a core <laughs> team that builds sort of all the infrastructure and APIs inside Visual Studio. And then we have all these other teams, such as the .NET team, the C++ team, the different language teams, but also uh, you know uh, cloud tooling teams and so on. And they build the features using those APIs that make up Visual Studio. And so you're you're kind of a PM for one of those uh, teams that use those those APIs. So therefore, there's a lot of collaboration with the core team. And, and especially for you as a language, um, when you're dealing with languages, it's it's particularly the editor team, which owns the editor itself, which is kind of interesting yeah. that, that's, that that's their own team. But that's actually a very big component. Yeah. So, so. anything that um, you think of as being shared across languages. So a good example is like the IntelliSense menu. And um, that's uh, the IntelliSense completion is when you type dot after a type or whatever, and it's that um, little drop box that you get. Um, or what do we call those combo boxes necessarily? I, I don't know, it's the list that you get in your IDE. So like C++ has that and C Sharp has that. That editor provides that platform feature and then each language fills in their data. That's a really good explanation. That's a exactly cool the, that's the difference between the, the platform team and the implementation teams, if we can, if we, they're not, that's not what they're called, but let's just call them that. Yeah, yeah. Language teams? I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, so they need to have a lot of context. And anytime we're like, oh, can we add this filter, this new icon? They're like, but how would this work in Python? And we're like, we don't know. <laughs> we're yeah, right. not people. Uh -huh. um, but this would um, encourage us, us to talk and make sure there's a good experience for kind of at the platform level if it's going to be a platform feature. Okay, so um, so let's just take this question here from Ashar. When is the next version of Visual Studio coming? So, oh. Ashar, my understanding is uh, that we have not made any announcements so far as to when that is. We um, don't know. I don't think we know. I don't uh, know. <laughs> okay, but make sure that if you're that you know we're going to tell you as soon as we know. Uh, on this uh, Visual Studio Office Hour stream or somewhere else. So don't worry, we'll, you'll know as soon as we will, maybe a little later, but uh, <laughs> but as soon as we can publicize it, we will, right? So don't worry about that, but there's nothing, there's no dates or anything yet. Okay. All right, so Kendra, so what is it that you do on a daily basis as a program manager? What does the job entail? Yeah, um, I think, one thing that's fun about it is it does change every day a lot. So a lot of um, the first part of my day is figuring out what to do like the rest of the week or the rest of the day with my time um, and kind of stacking a bunch of odd asks. Um, I think there's so many metaphors to describe what PMing is at Microsoft, I guess. One that kind of stuck with me is um, shipping is a bucket and you have to fill up the bucket to a certain line in order to ship. Devs are the big rocks that you put in, and PMs are the water that you pour in that fill in all of the gaps. Um, so it's a bunch of random stuff that needs to be uh, that needs to happen. So sometimes the more public stuff are like the talks and release notes and um, documentation that PMs need to figure out uh, what to work on or nag um, developers that a lot of bugs are coming in for a certain issue and that could kind of be prevented if we had better documentation or blog posts or that kind of thing. Um, then a lot of the other product work is uh, that is behind the scenes is talking with customers a lot. So doing um, surveys or community calls or live streams like this um, where we can kind of get feedback. Um, we also do suggestion triage, which I know Mads is a fan of. Um, so <laughs> all suggestions for Visual Studio, uh, it's it's in the, you, you've probably all seen the provide feedback tool at the top right corner of Visual Studio. You can also do a suggestion. So um, PMs triage all of those. Um, I spend uh, a few hours every week kind of testing out what the suggestion is and doing some like exploratory uh, research on um, who might have solved this problem in the past and um, what what exactly the problems that it solves and I kind of play with it and designs and if I have something I can propose it or um but at the very least we triage it to the right teams uh, yeah. on it. So you take all this input, you talk to all these customers and you put that in your you put that in like a ideas bank backlog, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And when time comes to uh plan what you should do in the upcoming sprints and so on, do you then pull from that list? How does that work? Absolutely. So um, every few months we will, uh, so I work across um, both GitHub, uh, which is like a bunch of open source code. Roslyn is open source. All of the tooling and improvements that we do is all happening on GitHub. Um, so you can follow along and see my team. It's all out there. Um, and so there's issues there and the votes there very, very much help. Um, and how we triage things. So every few months we'll look at the top voted issues that aren't um, bugs that are actually like new feature requests that need new designs and new proposals. Um, a lot of, at least on Roslyn, we will look on a week to week basis um, because we have really fast turnarounds. Uh, part of that is because we have several community members who are hopping on and just checking in features, which is so, so cool to see. Um, I think we have a lot of people uh, like Cyrus um, and uh, Sam Harwell who are engaging with the community to encourage like first time contributors. So if you're considering that we have open issues, um, <laughs> That's sorry, actually really cool. <laughs> you can, you can, you know, and those, those issues are marked in a way that, you know, you can identify them as, Hey, these are a good beginner type issue to fix. And then what do you do? Then you then fork the Rosslyn code base and you send a PR after you fixed it. Is that as simple as that? Or do you have to go through hoops yeah. because it's big Microsoft and 
no, no hoops. There's there are um, agreements that I think you have to check. But as soon as you make the pull request, we have bots that will ask you to sign things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah. Just fork it. We have a contribution guide that you can follow along. That's not okay. not too uh, complicated. Hopefully, All right? Awesome. Yeah. So, um, how do you then decide what goes into the product? Like when you have this backlog of of ideas and suggestions and whatnot, like how do you decide? What makes it and what doesn't make it? Yeah, um, it's a lot of team discussion. I actually will try to game the system just a little bit if there's a if there's a really important issue. Um, I might uh, propose a design or do um, sort of a Twitter survey asking for people to um, leave input or comments or what they would like to see. One big thing that came out recently was um, it actually helped us find a bug. We there is this really annoying dialog box that if you try to like debug while you have errors in your program, it'll say like, hey, do you want to run the last successful build? And 90, 95% of the time people are like, no, I, I need to fix those errors. I just didn't know I had errors and I pressed F5. Um, and the same thing happens with test runs. Uh, so we have a dialog box and uh, the debugger actually fixed it. They have a new dialog box that's a checkbox that says never show again, just like pop open the error list. Stuff. Um, and uh, they had actually checked that in, but we didn't uh, change the dialog box that testing shows. So there were two different ones. And I think in a couple other places, I think um, some build dialog or properties, I don't know, um, something else was using the wrong one too. So um, that was like instantly super high votes uh, because it came up on Twitter. Uh, so that kind of helps us prioritize that mm -hmm. and working to change that dialog box, hopefully. 16.8, no promises. All right, 16.8, that's good. I saw I saw that ticket on uh, developercommunity.visualstudio.com. You know, you can go in there and you can sort all the suggestions by the number of votes they've gotten and all that sort of stuff. And it's it's way up top. Like it's one of the most requested features <laughs> is to basically get rid of a, a feature or don't show a feature, I guess. Yeah, well, um, it's such a bad hiccup. And oh my gosh, the comments were so interesting. Um, a lot of people posted on Twitter that they have students that are like stepping through this and they will accidentally click continue and debug the last successful build, but they don't know the code they're stepping through does have errors and isn't the code oh. that was built. I know. So they, so I think someone commented that a student had been lost for like half an hour or something like that, or hours maybe um, before they realized what was going and just stopped their debug session and then realized they had errors. And I was like, Wow. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm well, sure this has happened thousands of times. Oh, anyway. This is a really good example of one of those paper cuts that we're able to remove. And for some reason, some paper cuts kind of survive year after year, major version to the next major version of Visual Studio. And then finally, we, we get it removed. So how, how do they, how come that some of these um, paper cuts or maybe just nuisances or whatever, inconveniences, let's call them, how do they survive for that long before they get sort of discovered and fixed? Oof. Well, that's quite a question. <laughs> um, uh, are you talking just like, like, why has this been here since like the beginning of time? I don't know when that dialog box was originally there, but things yeah. like that, or yeah, it's I kind of interesting think... how how some some things that are where our default behavior in a certain area maybe have been wrong for like a long time. And it takes us like many years, maybe sometimes to to fix them. Um, and I think this is one of them where we we default to show you, hey, do you want to run the last build? And probably that shouldn't be the default, right? Yeah. Uh, which we're now fixing. So that's great. Yeah. But like, so I don't know if, if you could say that they slipped through the cracks over the years or or what it is, but do you have any idea of how, how they come in and then why do they then be, dis how are they then discovered and fixed, you know, eventually? Mads asks the tough questions. <laughs> I think the obvious answer is um, we didn't see them at the time. Uh, we didn't. I think a lot of people suppose that our developer team is about ten times the size that it actually is. But mm -hmm. it turns out we don't. We and, and in a lot of cases, it's not that we like don't fully think through scenarios. But there are millions of scenarios with millions of customers. That one is a, like a really good example of more of a universal one. But um. A lot of like uh, more niche cases or even just like uh, deciding 
I don't know, um, each like development environment and SDK and platform that we're trying to target and satisfy is sort of a different, a slightly different view or different segment or have different options or different extensions that conflict um, with all of these tools. So mm. I, I think part of it is like the massive diversity of the developers that we're trying to um, uh, give a really smooth experience, I guess. Um, uh, that a lot of things might be missed or tooling might be broken in certain areas with updates. Um, and it's not because we don't test, we test extensively. Everything that's checked in, we have weeks of dog fooding before it goes out to public. And that dog fooding is like uh, 10,000, like at least internal users at Microsoft using Visual Studio. And if they didn't find it in their daily workflows, um, it's it's too bad because it still goes out to customers, but it is only ten thousand people you know, <laughs> using it. Like yeah. that's not extensive, not when it's going out to millions. Um, so something that massively helps us is when people hop on the preview channel, so we can find those a lot sooner and and make sure they don't get into stable mm -hmm. um, the GA releases. Yeah, that's a good point. Like we really really uh, appreciate whenever you're using the preview builds of Visual Studio because we, we do get to catch things before they reach the millions of people. So yeah. thank you if you're doing that. And if not, consider doing it. Uh, you get the features earlier and you get to uh, submit some feedback and, and make a better product for yourself as well, right? So um, yeah. So we we like to believe that it's a win-win if you do. And, um, and that's what we hear from people as well, so. And side-by-side -side install. You can install preview right next to your GA Visual Studio. So if one yep. breaks, you can go back to GA. <laughs> yep, exactly. So another one I heard uh, about like how some features or inconveniences or paper cuts or whatever, they kind of fall through the cracks. Um, someone was mentioning to me years ago was that, you know, we get used to those things, to those paper cuts, and then we kind of so don't terrible. see them anymore. And the same goes for all the users. And so sometimes people think that's a weird thing of Visual Studio, but they don't think about it because they know just to hit the escape key or whatever so that the dialogue goes away. And that's just how it is. And there's nothing they think about it. So no one ever reports the issue. But as soon as someone does and other people see it, it's like, yes, of course. Like a wildfire. Everyone, Everyone just piles on and upvotes. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, that's a better answer. Um, I like that more. <laughs> I'll get that question again someday. I'll use it. Um, yeah, well, definitely so many things I've gotten used to that I didn't notice until an intern pointed it out to me or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's funny, like we do get interns every summer and they, they tend to find some things that we just don't see anymore. So many things. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> so uh, someone is asking here if, if PMs at Microsoft code, like do we actually code features that be, are becoming checked into the source code and eventually end up in Visual Studio or how does that work? Uh, I did during my internships, but I haven't since I started as a full-time PM. Some PMs do. I think Philip Carter was like the main contributor. He was very proud for a few weeks. He was like the main contributor on the f -sharp repo. And he's the, the PM for that space. Um, so some definitely do. I think a little bit more on the .NET uh, PM team. Like, uh, yeah, with like Dan Roth and Glenn. Mm -hmm. uh, Andra and constantly and you know Emma Landworth and Rich and everything they're always creating tools or checking in something so and that kind of makes sense when it's open source because then the PM becomes an equal <laughs> pull requester to any other you know customer out there and the, a PM sorry not a PM a PR a pull request still has to be reviewed by the engineering and all that sort of stuff so that might be a much easier way for a PM to contribute code whereas most of Visual Studio is not uh, open source and so it has to go in through uh we have maybe slightly different mechanisms every team is a little bit different i guess but um but that must be a big difference that it's open source that way yeah and just even other microsoft employees who don't work on roslyn at all but have wanted to see changes we've actually especially on docs i don't know if you've noticed this uh, so our docs are open source and everything. We've had a ton of comments from Microsoft employees <laughs> trying to use our product and they don't work on the ASP.NET team or, or .NET at all. And they, they need they need us to fix our own docs though. So that's been really, really helpful. I, I'd feel like like two thirds of the comments that we've got in the past month, at least that I've been mentioned on are Microsoft employees, which has been funny. Mm -hmm. we're, we're 
engaging with our own. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's because we are our we are our own biggest customer, right? We, internally yeah. at Microsoft, we have, as you were saying, like ten thousands, if not more, users of Visual Studio, which is probably more than any other company out there. I, I guess yeah. so we are we are very I mean, much. A lot of teams don't work on, you know, in developer division that owns uh, Visual Studio and VS Code and ASP.NET and .NET and whatnot. So they are just consumers, just like other people, and they have yeah. the same same sort of feedback to give. So yeah, that's they're cool. off building Windows or Azure or something that's yeah. not exactly developer tools, but they're using Visual Studio and everything. Right. Actually, now that it occurs to me, it was the hackathon last month. So mm. maybe that that was the massive influx was people getting started and trying out a new technology. Um, that's fun. The company nice. hackathon. So, okay, so now you've looked through the, the you know, every two months you look through your backlog of ideas and you maybe you do some initial designs um, and you do your Twitter polls and all sorts of stuff. How do you then refine that idea? How do you get to that final design? Uh, or is it ever final? Like, what, but what, what is the process to, to make it something that you can hand over to engineering? Ooh, endless iteration. Um, so I think at some point, yeah, I do kind of sign off. We try to start... A lot of research work, at least in the past, I've tried to start research work like one to three months before the actual code would start being checked in. So um, we redesigned the test explorer in um, Visual Studio 16.2. Uh, and the research that I did for that was several months in advance and talking with hundreds of MVPs. And um, I probably did like six different rounds of studies where I changed things in the mock-up every single time um, and met with people. We have like quick pulses where we bring people into our labs. When we're doing this in person, um, we bring people into a lab and we like record um, what, they, what they're saying and their mouse clicks and that kind of stuff um, to see how they would interact with um, new UI and that kind of thing. So that happened. Um, some of the final mockups, I think I had two MVP calls. Those are the Microsoft most valued professionals. Um, and so that streamed to like uh, at least 100 people where I just walked through the new design that we were thinking of. I think we might have had a prototype at that stage. Um, and just to get general feedback, which was awesome. Um, MVPs are very, very focused on um, making sure that our like multi-target framework support was really, really good because they're the people creating um, uh, or writing a lot of like .NET standard libraries that um, people would then use. So they're sort of like the second tier contributors um, that because people use a lot of their libraries. Um, so walking through sort of all kinds of customers at different stages was really, really helpful. So it's like a continuously iterative process, it sounds like. You, yeah. you 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 go validate the design with the customers, come back, make tweaks, validate it again over and over until you have something that's ready. That yeah. Right? Yeah. So probably a few mock-ups in, we had five or so. We I had a pretty good flow of what we wanted, and that's when the developers started implementing it. But as we went, there was a lot that we needed to figure out <laughs> that was totally mm -hmm. new. Um one of the really fun things we made was um, a customizable group by, which you might have seen. So um, before you could only choose one level to organize tests, and it was like either group by project or class or namespace. Um, and now you can have multiple tiers and they're fully customizable. So um, I think back in 16.2, yeah, we released, it was only grouped by project namespace and class or the old behavior where there was only a single option. Now you can group by like duration and then project and then namespace or any combination mm. of all of those groupings. Um, and the new UI for selecting that was weird, but uh, I think it's good. <laughs> we, we hadn't come up with this system before. I could probably show it really quick if you wanna mm. hop over to screens. Sorry, mm. I geek out about design. <laughs> We totally can, if you want okay. to. Thank you. Let's take a look. Yeah, let's do it. OK, cool. So this was the group by that we established. You need um, to share your screen. Oh, I thought I did. You did under, when we did the rehearsal. Share. <laughs> I did. I did OK once. All right. How does it look now? Oh, 
It's there. Okay. It's there. Excellent. You can click that hide button on that uh, bar that goes on in the bottom. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this is the new group buy. So before it was basically just um, a single tiered list, but now the order in which you click it. So let's say I want project and then state um, is the order in which it sees uh, it organizes. So this first tier is the project. And then the next one is the state. So passed or failed. And I could do something like duration and then state and notice the order in which I click it is uh it gets one and two, and then if I unclick, click again, it goes two. If I unclick this, duration becomes the second tier. So this was very, like, I haven't really seen this used a lot. <laughs> it was very new, um, but we were trying to come up with something simple that wasn't a ton of dialogue boxes. That didn't feel like a full designer mode that was really snappy to use. And we have a bunch of presets up here that are um, kind of also an option that you can use. That's fantastic. Uh, I yeah. love that. So Thank you, that, Figuring out that kind of thing, we needed to have several meetings with UX. They were like, mm -hmm. we hate that this is, so we always, always in UI, you try to use like already used paradigms. You don't mm -hmm. want to teach someone to cook something completely new, but they let this in. Um, and it's had a pretty good reception so far. Uh, yeah. So is, um, this in, is this in preview or is it out in the in the full update that was released? It's been in GA for a few months, I believe. Probably yeah. since sixteen. Oh, I'm not gonna get it. Maybe <laughs> four or five something. Okay, so around the holiday break, the the start of the new year. Yeah. Don't quote me on it. Let's see. How do I stop sharing? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, yeah. let's just. Um, so speaking of the preview, um, there is a question here. Why restricting the license of the preview version? We can't build production code with it. So that's that's true. Um, so the the preview version right now has that notion that you can't, there's no go live license as we call it. You can't actually use it for production software. It's something we're looking into. So I know that some people have gotten around it funny enough. Um, and so I, I don't know the full license, but I know that I've heard that some people, they have their, their build server actually has the, the the regular version of Visual Studio installed. And so you do your build, your production builds happen through that. And therefore it's okay. Don't quote me on whether or not that's accurate, but if it <laughs> is, that means that you can use uh, preview, um, on, you know, as your daily driver, the whole development team can do that. And then as long as your build server is, is running the, the GA, you're fine. I, I'm not sure that's true or not, but it's something we're looking into because we know a lot of people have issues with that. So thanks for that question. Um, <clears throat> All right. Let's see here. That was X unit. I think there's a question on what test framework I was using. Yep, those are facts. Oh. I was using X unit. What about MS test? Is that still uh, going strong? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh. I have a graph if you want. If you ever want to break down of what framework you should use and why, I can, <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that. Nice. Um, Oh yeah, so whether or not people code, uh, you know, James, he's uh, Montemagno from from the .NET team. He's saying, I enjoy writing code from time to time, right? So uh, again, it's di different from PM to PM how much they code and, and if that code makes it into any product or it's, a lot of it is demo code, right? Because a, a, a PM, yeah. we, have to, we have to do the demos, go to the conferences, show off what the engineering team has done. So is that something that you spend a lot of time on? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of the demo code is also like trying things out or doing um, tutorials or working your features into a different person's script is probably one of the trickier things because you um, you can add like a few meaningless class libraries that trigger all of the code fixes that they need, but like really incorporating it can take some time. It's a weird like coding plus demo razzle dazzle skill. Uh, try trying to merge those two is, two is kind of interesting. Right. Um, yeah, because it's not always it's not always just your demo, right? Sometimes it's you're 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 presenting the demo for a full hour, all your stuff, but then mm -hmm. sometimes you're contributing demos to a keynote from Scott Hanselman's keynote, for instance, yes. or even you you're doing Scott Guthrie. Scott keynote. Guthrie. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so that's Correct. where it's a little bit more tricky, and the logistics are like maybe more tight. Yeah. So yeah. how do you, what's your process for that? How do you prepare for a demo? How do you decide yeah. even what to demo? 
Um, so a lot of the stuff we want to demo is what we've recently um, merged into the product. So we kind of can look over the release notes always to see um, what code fixes and refactorings we felt like were really important or that we think um, we would use every day and um, generating like more excitement out of that um, is always really interesting. I think so, what, something that people loved that we just checked in was um, date time and time span literal strings get completion in um, IntelliSense. So if you are with if your cursor is within one of those and you type control space, it will list out all of the characters that you can use in date time. So it'll have like mm colon and it'll explain those are that's the month. Yeah, that's like the month yeah. format. So it actually has date time format completion. If it's uh, capital M, it's it's month. Otherwise, it's minutes, right? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> See, I don't remember because now my IDE knows yeah. uh, and it can hopefully tell me. I love that feature. It's like yeah. another one of those. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a paper cut because it's not been something that's been annoying from being a wrong implementation in the past. It was just something like when you see it, it's like, oh, I've been wanting that for my entire life, writing code, and uh, now it's there and it's it's wonderful. Yeah, if it saves you a journey to our docs or Stack Overflow, and yeah. it's something we can like give you in the context of where you already are, it's usually a big win. Yeah. So, um, so, so just kind of getting a feel for. Uh, what's important and how to talk about what's important. There are so oh, yeah. many aspects to a demo where we're, as we're thinking about the script, we're branding <laughs> the product. Like, okay, how do we want to talk about this? Are dynamic playlists going to be a thing? Or should we just call them playlists that now behave dynamically and all of that? And, and deciding what keywords people are actually going to use to search is um, mm. interesting. <laughs> so you do, So you do that type of job uh, figuring those things out before you do a demo at like a conference. That's part of the demo flow. And it sounds like almost marketing. Yeah. Like yeah. marketing usually come up with, do they come up with the names of things? And I don't know, but. Well, uh, yeah, the really important things, like the big deal things for yeah. sure. They they will talk to us about like, I'm sure IntelliCode had like a bunch of arguments about it i don't know and rebranding or whatever visual studio online or rather code spaces yeah that's a really good example of its branding journey um mm. it's of evolution uh so the big things yeah but uh how to talk about some things oh my gosh we had a really long discussion about the suppression operator um that was interesting so what is that what is a suppression operator it's basically the exclamation point but that can also be the non-negative. Um, yeah. It's interesting. So how to talk about that took about three hours to, <laughs> wow. to talk about. Actually, it's I could probably read the release notes right now. Uh, and and I, I, I want to read it because I'm not good at like reciting it yet because uh, we went back and forth a lot. Um, I think we were trying to talk about if it's a non-null suppression operator, because the exclamation point at the end of a type can be um, like a, a null check. Oh, um, I'm not familiar with this. Is this like a C-sharp 9 thing? or? Uh, I, yes. I thought it might have been a bit earlier. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's um, one of the newer C-sharp features. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of our code fixes is actually showing... Um, the suppression operator being used with is, like mm -hmm. is as an is, a uh, pattern yeah. matching, is not what you expect it to be doing. It's not doing is not. If you use an exclamation point in front of is, um, what it's actually doing is a null check of the left side. Um, <laughs> so okay. just being able to explain what the problem is alone is interesting, um, right. especially when you're yeah constricted by... Uh, Let's see what you're normally using. So is this 16.8? I can share my screen really quickly to actually give. I'm such a visual person, so don't worry. We're going to get into the Yeah, go for it. Let's the see it. visual. Oh, maybe it was 16.7. Yeah. All right. Let me. And 16.7 is the latest release that is out there, right? It so is. if you have the latest version of Visual Studio, you have 16.7. Are, are we still in preview? No, we just released sixteen point seven GA and yeah, last Wednesday. Preview one, yeah, it's out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you, you don't have it, people go get it. Yeah. 
All right, your screen is full screen. So, um, excellent. So this control dot, these light bulbs, that's productivity, that's what I was talking about earlier. So this is interesting. So you have an exclamation point, which is, um, you know, the suppression operator in front of is. <laughs> um, so you'd think it's doing sort of is not, right? Yeah. It's not. So this yeah, is like it, neg it negates the word is. Yeah, so this is checking if the left side, just regular pattern matching for if you haven't used it yet, it's checking if the left side is the same type as the mm -hmm. right side. So yep. this is, yeah. Um, so if I have an exclamation point here, um, before we didn't have a code fix. Right now you can see if I scroll in, it's getting a little warning. Um, and that's because the suppression operator here, it's saying it has no effect and can be misinterpreted. So the interesting thing is, so it's not negating is, that's our like warning for that. Um, the other thing is it's asking to fix the formatting because it thinks that you have you just have your exclamation point in the wrong sense place. And it oh, would yeah. make sense if you were doing, if you actually were intending to do um, a null check on the left side. But, uh, sorry, I, I don't even think I'm saying that one right. It's like a null, I'm not sure. Anyway. This is a hard one. It is, a, it is very interesting. So this is what it's suggesting if you genuinely want to negate the expression. Yep, yep. So move it outside. Mm -hmm. And the other one is just, well, the first one is just to move this, this entirely because it does nothing. So yeah. erasing that doesn't actually change the comparison. Mm -hmm. um, so just talking about that has been really interesting. So um, the text that we used was, yeah, so select... Um, Warning and code fix when a suppression operator is present but has no effect. Right. So, okay, that's what we used. You know, I think <laughs> I saw that the other day. I was doing some coding, and I think I saw this, and I I didn't even know that there was a new suppression operator, and so I was I was confused. But I also kind of trust those code fixes; they have never failed me before. So I just took it, <laughs> and I, I you know, and it, and it worked. And I'm like, I don't understand this. So my code was probably weird to begin with. Since I had that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how I got into that state. Yeah. yeah. But I trusted and it worked. So that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so we got a question here. Let's take that, Kendra. What is the role of a program manager? Is it similar to a product owner or project manager? What's your take on that? Well, I'd say project managers might do a little bit more of, uh, it is a complicated question because we kind of arbitrarily assign roles a lot just based on like if it fits the team and the person in the context that you're already working in and like the title is less important. Mm -hmm. I think project managers might do more of the dev lead work of um, like actually assigning which devs will work on what, um, but identifying what should be worked on and that priority is more what the program managers uh work a lot with the dev team to do. So a lot of the program manager's job is providing data to decide priority, whether or not that's um, customer interviews or going through the backlog, um, trying to kind of deduplicate suggestions or think like, oh, okay, we have like 10 small bugs about this area, but if we actually just like redesign the whole thing instead of fixing those bugs, it might come up with a better experience, which is sometimes the case um, people are running into like a lot of paper cuts that we actually should have just avoided from the get go um, by having a better design. Um, so things like that. I think product owners, we do have a lot of in common with because we do a lot of like, how are we going to launch um, a new thing? And PMs will do a lot of the legwork of uh, figuring out how to set up re uh, repos or contacting legal, uh, getting the brands approved <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, talking with marketing. I don't know. Yeah. So that's all the, all the water that goes in the bucket, right? All those. Yeah. Things. All um, of the random things. <laughs> so I, I, I guess maybe that also changes a little bit depending on what feature you're designing. If it's a feature that has, that's sort of isolated, that can be handled by just one engineering team and you can do it sort of in isolation, you kind of, you're maybe more of a product owner at that point. But yeah. product owner as you 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 design the the feature. You you're kind of assisting the engineering team with their questions and so on, and, and doing all the customer research and whatnot. But if it's a if it's a feature that requires a lot of stakeholders from other teams, and you have to orchestrate, everyone have to do the, their thing at the right time to make it all work together, and uh, then it maybe it's a little there's a little bit of more project management in that. Is that yeah. your experience as well? 
Yeah, I think they, a lot of times you just need to do whatever needs to be done <laughs> and that ends up being your job description. Um, yeah. Something that comes to mind is like Playwright um, that's been, that's been launched. I think it actually did go um, 1.0. It was in preview for a while. Playwright is um, a new UI testing framework that we've made that's um, sort of the next iteration of Selenium and trying to finally um, fix a lot of problems like uh, flakiness and um, uh, just all of the UI tests weren't often built with like services in mind and having the right sort of uh, expectations of like latency. And if something's just like running slowly, you don't want your test to fail, you want it to wait and you don't want to manually build in sleep threads or, or that kind of thing. So um, anyway, they're, they that's such a self-contained project because it's a framework. And I really think of the PMs doing it as um, sort of product owners, um, figuring out how they want to re write release notes and run their uh, their repo and everything and, and how they want to announce it and uh, publicize it with the community has been really, really interesting to see. And I'm really excited about the, uh, the framework yeah. <laughs> as a testing person. Oh, absolutely. It's funny how, um, like when it comes to like the, the product versus project management of things, like the way I kind of see it sometimes is that there's a, there's a spectrum, right? From an individual PM, you can either, some people are very technical and love writing code, let's say, right? And some people are super into project management, like doing your Gantt charge, making sure everyone does things at the right time, having that overview, right? And, and, and then most people are somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah. So I think for a lot of people, you can kind of move into like make the job work for you wherever you are on that spectrum. So for me, I like the technical stuff and I struggle with some of the project management, but from a motivational perspective, I don't enjoy it that much, Yeah. Uh, but I have to do it to some extent, but then you kind of learn some tips and tricks. You can maybe get some help from some people. Often there's like engineering teams that the developers are happy to do some of the work uh, because they are also on sort of that spectrum maybe to some extent. Yeah, um, it's it's hard to convince them if they don't want to do the work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that can be weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, something that occurs to me is I love diving into um, our telemetry and doing a lot of data analysis for what we do get back, um, either from like the .NET SDK or Visual Studio. Um, and just learning from that because you can ask, you know, you can ask 100 people how they use a feature, but they might be interpreting it differently than how they actually use it. And um, yeah. being able to figure out like, especially since it's millions of developers that we have, even if we only look at internal telemetry, finding the actual like numbers and the data behind it, the divide, I really enjoy. So I've definitely like reshaped my job and the kinds of questions I ask and stuff to um, be able to provide like more of the data insight um, mm -hmm. than constantly reaching out. Like I'm still trying to step through how we do the our happiness tracking surveys in Visual Studio. The little pop up that says like, "Hey, would you like to leave a little bit of feedback on Visual Studio or talk with our developer teams?" Those little surveys. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to write one and get one checked in. I need to talk with Ruben. <laughs> um, yeah, right. But we should yeah, get so, him on the show so he can explain it so everyone knows how. Hey. <laughs> and where that data goes and that that could be useful mm -hmm. um but yeah so just kind of getting into working on that and yeah it, it's hard to you don't want to bias it too much to just like the kind of work that you want to do and how you think you can solve certain problems but uh that's kind of also why you work in a team so i feel like i balance out some of the pms that i work with who are super survey gurus Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having those two perspectives and two different skill sets is really helpful. Yeah, it's so. kind of interesting how it's almost like every PM, we have a different sort of skill set or things that we're experts in or whatever that, you know, but we need we need the rest of the team to fill in the gaps. And I think that yeah. works really well. And, and I, personally, I really like that that I can tailor the job as a PM to my interests you know, it takes time to establish trust and authority and all these sort of things of what you're good at and and then and learn the stuff that you're not good at and how to overcome those things. And um, yeah, who to lean on. Yeah. Is that something you're struggling with, like overcoming some of the, you know, less interesting aspects? And be, be fair, right? It's less interesting to you, but it might be the favorite thing of another PM. So it's very personal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm trying to think about what's less interesting that I try to avoid. I just try to block it out. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes a lot of the internal discussion, like needing, yeah, that's actually, that's, a, that's the example I can use. A lot of the, we have whole um, PM efforts of reaching out to internal teams to talk directly with them and sit down and ask like what's blocking their team from moving to uh, maybe .NET Core from .NET Framework um, or migrating to .NET 5 and start consuming the preview or something like that. And um, I have very little energy for it. I don't like uh, hand-holding, uh, I guess, internal teams in order to use the product. I feel like if they love it, they'll just use it and they'll use the internet and they'll figure it out and all of our documentation is there. They shouldn't need like a personal relationship and they shouldn't feel like, you know, they um, owe you something. And that's why they're using the product. And that can happen when you're like, hi, can I kind of hold your hand and, and can you use this and everything? Cause, and I feel like that throws off the feedback mm-hmm. when you have that too. Like I rather, um, I don't know, people find it based on Google searches. <laughs> it seems like a more, I don't know. So I, I definitely struggle with that, which is silly because um, we do, we really, really do need that kind of high contact feedback because they will tell us like, a, like the small paper cuts about the journey and stuff. I would, I wouldn't hear so much of that stuff uh, if we didn't have those teams engaging with them, um, sort of our, our one engineering system customers um, all, all internally. So I appreciate it. And I'm glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so- so that's kind of cool, all that flexibility. And we, we had a question, and now I can't find it, but I do remember what it said. Um, oh, here it is. So Julio is asking uh, if it's possible to work from L.A., and he says in parentheses Peru. So whether it's Los Angeles or it's the country of Peru, like can you become a PM or an engineer and not live in Seattle or Redmond or any of the sort of the hubs of, of where we have development? Yeah, we've been, we had a huge push to build our Prague office um, really recently. The whole test platform is in Prague now. Yay. So VS test console.exe. The the Czech Republic, Prague. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. MS test. Um, I am currently working from Los Angeles. I don't know if that's what he was commenting on with LA. I don't know if there's a city named LA in Peru. I don't know. Um, So I don't know what our hiring is right now. I know. Amanda Silver typically tweets a lot of open PM positions. Um, I'm not sure if all of them have like remote marked or if they're they're based in Redmond, but yeah. right. So um, yeah, and we do have um, you know members of the team all over the world, like Australia, all over Asia, Africa, whatever. And yeah. um, um, I think traditionally PMs, depending on the role, has been more suited for maybe they. We said, okay, it's better if you're close to the engineering team that you're working with. So a lot of them is like, oh, we don't allow for remote. But I think with the pandemic and all this sort of stuff, I think we kind of just learned that, no, that's actually just absolutely fine. So I think it's going to be interesting coming out on the other side. I I think just all over the place, we're going to see a lot more remote friendly job postings. I mean, yeah, I don't know what our policies will be uh, after all of this when things are back to normal if that ever happens um, uh, whatever normal yeah. Be. yeah we've definitely proved um you can do quite a lot of functioning perfectly uh normally well ad- adequately normally as a pm i guess uh remotely mm-hmm. so that'll be interesting i know we do we do have positions for sure that are available so you said that you're in LA, but you live up here in in the seattle area yes. um, i'm just here so, with family yeah so is that are you are you gonna come back to the office once we're allowed to? Or are you gonna stay at home? Yeah. Or are you gonna mix and match? <laughs> I'm probably gonna mix and match. I was already at like about three quarters, um, three quarters in Washington, and one quarter remote working from LA with like long weekends or whatever, so I can be with family. Um, so now it might be I don't know. Um, I think it could be like 50-50 for a while. I I really don't want to get FOMO when everyone goes back to the office. The fear of missing out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm going to get that because I love uh, actually hanging out with people and being able to like grab a beer after work um, and get really into discussions. That's when the real designs happen. No, 
Um, yeah, yeah but, it is. You can be, you can be honest. <laughs> yeah, I still have a ton of friends in Washington and everything. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, you know, from the match. different uh, PMs I've talked to, even like managers are all talking about like doing a mix and match scenario where they're, okay, let's work from home two days a week and then in the office. Yeah, um, yeah here's uh, Matt. He says office work is overrated, right? I've uh, been working for MS for years now and never went more than a few days a year at the office. Yep, yeah, exactly. So um, so you can totally do it. And and I'm, I'm going to figure out how to do it as well. I got little kids and I think uh, like if I could figure out how to take my Fridays and make something that's an isolated set of things where I don't need input from others, I can just go ahead. I need to write a blog post. I'm doing a live streaming of some coding or whatever. Um, and maybe I'm going to write an extension or whatever it is. Uh, then I won't do that for the rest of the week. I'll, I'll move all that to Friday and then I can just be home and do that. I'm thinking of, of that. And I think that's probably going to be very common for a lot of people. Yeah, that's already what I was trying to accomplish, actually, like having a Monday um, working from L.A. where I could do and I could kind of block off my data mining time uh, then and write, you know, 200 line queries that. I enjoy for some reason um, and and just kind of get into it and do a lot of like the focused work without interruptions. It's kind of nice. Right. I think Brad Wilson, he, uh, he has a good idea. We should ask Cortana to help. Like basically we should outsource yeah. our job to like a digital assistant uh, when working from home. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> That's Maybe probably what Brad is doing. If Brad I could is- recognize anything that I say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, now the feature has been designed. I'm going to go back to this whole daily late daily workflow. We're 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 all over Let's the map. Do right it. Now. It's your uh, live stream. <laughs> yeah, right. So now we go back. We have the features designed. You're iterating, um, and uh, you know, then at what point does the engineering team gets involved, and how do they take it from there? What is the? How do you like hand it over to them if you can speak of it as such? Ooh. Well, they're involved from the get-go. Like even when before I'm creating my mockups, we had so many, we had like many, many hour-long design meetings, um, where and just initial brainstorm meetings too, and like just like listing out the problems and asking them if that made sense or if I missed one or they thought one thing would be like take more importance over the other. Um, and a lot of their questions would be like, "Yeah, does this work at scale?" and like uh, all of that. So they're definitely there at the beginning. Um, I think once I hand off to the engineers, it's hopefully when I have a mock-up that's been uh, tested that I've been a bit satisfied with the customer response so far. Um, Sometimes I can measure that like numerically if they rate it on a scale of one to five, like would you use this? Is this, do you prefer this over the previous design? That kind of thing. Um, But yeah, sometimes it's just general positive uh, uh, walking them through. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's faster to ask the engineering team to actually just prototype so that we can fight it internally. Um, some things are so, with the test explorer, it's easy to do mockups because a lot of like the UI and just view changed. With some other things, like um, recently we changed um, how our overload appears. Uh, we have like an overload helper in Quick Info that you can like uh, use arrow keys to navigate between overloads that are uh, loaded in IntelliSense. Is that the control shift space to invoke the uh, signature help? Yes, signature help is the name. (laughs) So now, so before that would load and um, completion would load after you started typing inside of the parentheses. Now completion loads immediately. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, good. I'm glad you like it because if some people wanted to use arrow keys to toggle the um, signature help, they have to hit escape to like go back up to that menu because right now both just appear at the same time. I really like it because um, for IntelliCode, you know, those uh, things in your in the in the IntelliSense list that has a star in front of it at the top of the list, mm-hmm. they wouldn't be visible. So before I started typing, and then I might have like based on my typing, I would filter them away. But it might have been exactly what I needed. And so I really enjoy that they just come out now automatically. Yeah, so you see them a bit sooner. That's what we thought like most people would prefer. But that kind of interaction is so difficult because it happens like instantly, right? 
-hmm. It's so difficult to get people's feedback. So we just needed people to start using it and preview it and dog food and everything to understand if anyone screamed uh, (laughs) that they're like, oh, no, I can't. I think I can't remember if we decided to add an option or not. We try to avoid adding options because Mm -hmm. it just ends up with an infinitely complicated IDE with people all have their own settings and some conflict in different states and everything. Um, So if we know something's like the preferable design, we want to just check it in by default and not have it as an option. Um, So I think, uh, yeah, I think it's checked in right Mm -hmm. now. So um, uh, doing that is sometimes I will ask engineers to prototype right off the bat because there's, I can't just say, but what if you saw this? Right afterwards, how would you feel about it? Getting that initial yeah. reaction was super um, feasible and in, in sort of a mock-up. Yeah, there has to be like, we have to basically do a live testing of people writing code. And uh, and so yeah. that's another part of where the preview comes in because we that allows us to do those tests before we roll it out to the millions of people. And so another good mm-hmm. reason for everybody to use it. I really like the, uh, the thing you said about settings. We don't want to add settings because the default behavior should be the right behavior. Um, that's also a hard one, I guess, sometimes. Uh, but it's so I, hard. <laughs> that's why we have so many settings. <laughs> there has been examples where we've introduced a new feature that was disabled by default, and you had to like enable it. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about the preview flag where you say, okay, I want to try the latest preview features. I'm talking like a regular feature that was added, usually a smaller feature, but, but nonetheless. And people don't really go into a tools options and change any of that. So you're basically, you've spent time writing, you know, developing a feature that very few people are going to use, and that that time might have been spent better doing something else, right? Yeah, so that's, that's a hard balance as well. Like sometimes, and sometimes that is not even meant. It, we didn't we didn't hide it behind a, a, a checkbox disabled by default. It just happened to go that way because we found out too late maybe in our user testing that people, not everyone loves it, let's mm-hmm. say. And so we can't, we're afraid to have it on by default. Mm-hmm. We need to tweak the design a little bit. Um, yeah. So, and so that's... It, that's yeah, a no, good example. That sometimes that's why we, we do this. And you might have noted that sometimes. It's not always on purpose, but sometimes it is. And um, yeah. yeah. And that's a good example of like people will never discover the feature if we don't have it on by default, even if most people would love it. Yeah. So we then have to decide if we turn it on and make a small percentage of people very grumpy because we turned on something that they didn't want and would never want. Um, but if that's only like 2% of people and otherwise 70% of people would have never discovered it, but they did really want it. Uh, ouch. <laughs> yeah. We just have to make some tough decisions. <laughs> yep. And that's part of the PM's job too, right? To to yeah. help make those decisions. Oftentimes we even have to like escalate them up to like managers and, and director level and stuff because sometimes they have wider implications and that's part of the Always job too. Fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the job is about communicating and managing expectations to managers and engineering teams and such, isn't it? A lot of emails. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, how do you like that part? The emails? Yeah, sort of the communication. Not everyone is, is keen on communicating. I don't mind it. I love that I have an opportunity to uh, answer questions and sort of represent the team and be sort of a voice box. So I'm a little bit, I'm kind of visible. So even internally, I'll get Microsoft employees that could file a bug or wherever, but they know me. So they know they can just die in me and get something on the backlog on the team. Yep. And I'm like, file a bug later. Um, please don't have me be a filter on all feedback. Um, but uh, I, I do kind of like getting that interaction because it educates me, educates me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know what things are coming in and um, being kind of a, a microphone for the team can be really interesting. So yep. I don't mind it. It helps me know how the team is being perceived too. So when I get someone who runs Cloud Talks in Azure, like, hey, I heard all of your productivity stuff. We love it over here in Azure. We got to get more of that. I can <laughs> I can say, cool, I know how this is perceived. And I get that like in-depth um, interaction of like what worked really well. Oh, you, they're actually doing a boot camp um, like next week or something. And they're going to allow me to try out code spaces on their unsuspecting new hires. Um, so I'm going to get a ton of like really fresh feedback probably. Um, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Great. Yeah. All right, Kendra, <laughs> this is this has been uh, an absolute pleasure and uh, a nice window into the role of, of, of PM, I hope, for the audience. 
Um, there is like one last question here. Any plans for features for comparing code across branches? So I know the answer to that one. And that is that there is a suggestion ticket open. If you go to developercommunity.visualstudio.com, search for it because I don't have the URL on top of my head. Uh, it's either under review or it's even on roadmap. So I do believe it's coming or it's something that they're beginning to look into. So um, to go check it out. Nice. All right. Uh, we went through a bunch of questions here too. That's wonderful. I didn't post all of them under the, the video here, but we, we did go through quite a bit of them. And um, thank you so much, Kendra. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Um, can I do a plug for my live stream? You, yeah, absolutely. Once a month, I do .NET community standup with Tooling with Cody and uh, Jordan, and we talk about Roslyn stuff, sometimes VS for Mac, sometimes uh, Visual Studio and VS Code, all things .NET Tooling. And where can they see that stream? On YouTube, on the .NET Foundation, or Twitch on the Visual Studio channel. Oh, so that's twitch.com slash Visual Studio? Yeah. Or well, on YouTube? TV, I think, is there. Oh, it's okay. But yeah, Visual Studio. And, it's and on, on YouTube, it's the .NET Foundation. The .NET Foundation has their own channel on YouTube, so go there. Yep. yep. We do .NET community streams every week on rotating topics, including languages and runtimes, ASP.NET, uh, Entity Framework, Windows Desktop, Me Tooling, lots of stuff. It's good. Awesome. So make sure everybody to catch uh, Kendra on those live streams as well. And um, until next week, thank you for tuning in. See you then. Farewell. Thank you.